I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Are you asking so, questions? Okay. Yes, I will ask you some questions. But before we get started and asking those questions, I would love it if you could tell our viewers and our loyal clients what your credentials are. Because you're a very qualified man. I am. So you are. You are indeed. Okay. Well, I uh, I am the uh, Charles A. Dana Professor of History and Politics, and Chairman of the History and Politics Department at Congress College. I have been a college professor for 47 years, starting my 42nd year at, at Converse. That is over three times the span of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I hope to be doing this for quite a few more years. We hope so as well. We and hope so I, as well. My um, uh, areas of, uh, I teach world affairs, uh, and I was just quoting this the other day. My uh, son in the first grade, someone asked him what his father did. And he said, he teaches girls about wars. <laughs> and I, you do. Basically, you he, do. Had, he had it correct then. He has it correct mm -hmm. then. I'm dealing with the war and mm -hmm. violence and things like that. So that's, that, those are my purported credentials. I see. I see. Um, and I did fail to state this is Joe Dunn. He is a professor here at Converse College where I attend school. Um, and Dr. Joe Dunn. And we're very excited to have you on board. For this week's blog post. Um, I just want to ask you since your kind of area of special, uh, specialty is like um, war and political violence as we've just stated. So history and politics are kind of your expertise. So I wanted to ask you throughout history what are some preemptive wars since the resolution we're working with is that preemptive wars are morally justified. Okay well let's start with the definition. Okay. Let's make a distinction. I agree. Preemptive war and preventive war. Exactly. Because these are these are very it's a very important distinction. Preemptive war is that you basically know right. all the evidence that you are going to be attacked and so you attack first. So now, the State Department in my knowledge has said that the threat in order to be preemptive the threat has to be like incontrovertible. Yeah. In, Meaning like you can't yeah. Debate yeah, it, right? That's right. Okay. It's under under um, international law. It must be inconvertible, absolute, and immediate. Okay. Um, this is the and there and actually there have been very few wars in history, uh, certainly in modern times that right. have been preemptive. Now, preventive war is more common. Right. Preventive war. Preventive war is that you believe that conditions exist that will ultimately lead to war. And you take action to lessen the uh, military conflict right. that would uh, happen to you. These are quite common. Um, and example, example, like preemptive war, the one that's uh, preemptive war, the one that's commonly mm -hmm. cited uh, is Israel's the Six sixty-seven war. war when Israel right. attacked because they it was inconvertible that uh, the Egyptians particularly, not in one incident, but in the, in the collage of it, in a, in a series mm -hmm. of incidents, we're going to attack them. Now, preventive war, uh, several. Um, right. Israel, once again, is involved quite a bit in preventive war, right. uh, attacking uh, the arsenic reactor in 81 because the argument was the, the Iraqis were developing a nuclear weapon and ultimately would be a strike. Um, the... Uh, the U.S. war in Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, preventive war, and the talk right now about uh, North Korea would be a right. class of preventive war. So the, the distinction is a very important distinction, and mm -hmm. then both come under the question of just war. Right. Um, but uh, to answer your question, there have not been very many right. defined preemptive wars. Right. Right. Lots of pre preventive war. So, and one of the terms in the resolution is that moral justification, which we think is really interesting because typically debate resolutions will ask you whether or not something should be done. And of course, argument could be made that should does have moral implications and considerations, but for the resolution to explicitly state it is or isn't morally justified debates is quite interesting. So do you think the moral justification of preemptive war is like one of the main concerns throughout history? Well, again, let's first of all, let's talk about the question of just war. Sure. Because this has been a, a historical question, uh, history. When is a war a just war? Mm -hmm. No matter how it starts, when is it just, when it's not just? And there are all kinds of views on that. Um, part of them are theological. Obviously, for a pacifist, there is no just war. Right, right. Uh, but international law has, <laughs> has uh, defined 
the, the condition, the conditions of a just war, which essentially mean that uh, it must be um, as unavoidable as part. It's something it simply cannot be avoided. Right. It must. There must. You don't go to war unless there is presumed. Uh, reason that you can be successful mm -hmm. and achieve the goals of the war, and then it has minimal damage to civilians, etc. I never think of a just war. But the whole question of, of, of a just war, so, and that's uh, an argument throughout history what is right, just war, right. what is not just. So, preemptive war is really a subset of the question of just war, right? But a, the more, uh, a more intense subset. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. If, if you believe that there is no such thing as just war, right. then it doesn't it's matter. The, it doesn't right. matter the morality of a preemptive war or not. Any war right. in which you, any war that takes place, is by definition immoral. Mm -hmm. Right. And sorry, uh, not only pa pacifists but many others would say. Right. right. And I mean, no one could argue that war, almost by definition, is immoral. The question is. Um, the question is the basis of, 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 of immorality. Right, uh, right. Probably Reno, Reinhold Niebuhr said it best, that there is a, in the questions of morality, there's morality which applies to the individual. And individual morality cannot necessarily be extrapolated to larger society. Right. It is moral man, immoral society, that, that war could come, obviously things that happen in war are by definition immoral. Right. Immoral for individuals, but is it, it does it become morally acceptable uh, because it's a larger society? So right, it's kind are, of like a utilitarian thought there. Yeah, right. Okay. So all of these are parts of the uh, of the background to make a distinct uh, distinction on uh, preemptive. More. So back to your question. What now? What, <laughs> now that I've rambled over all kinds of No, no, no. That's a great answer to the question. I think it leads to more questions. And the real thing that we've been thinking about is essentially what you just said. Like the morality of preemptive warfare is going to sort of go back to the individual mindset on war itself. Um, so we have been looking at moral frameworks with which people could address the question of preemptive war. Um, and obviously utilitarianism is a really popular one when it comes to war. Um, I feel like a lot of students don't fully understand it and then misuse it. Uh, and they're just like, well, it's what's best for everybody. Not quite, um, but essentially. And we've also been looking at um, Kant's categorical imperative about how if it's not good for the, if it's not universally beneficial, then it is immoral. Um, we've also been talking about Aristotle's golden mean, how, you know, the median in between two extremes is the most moral. So what do you think are some other useful moral frameworks to approach this question? Well, that's, that, uh, that's, that's tough. Yeah. Um, obviously, the moral framework depends upon where your moral framework comes from. Right. So, um, isn't it interesting that this resolution is asking students to figure out where they derive their moral and then apply that to war. That's no, that almost is, that unheard is, of. That is exactly the issue. If you, if you haven't, and most people haven't, the university <laughs> haven't really addressed seriously what is the basis of where my moral uh, constitution comes from. Um, is it theological? Mm -hmm. And if it's theological, you know, obviously there's a very difference uh, between Catholic sense of just war right. and right. and uh, non-catholics or catholics have have devoted a tremendous amount of attention to the question of just war right. and, and obviously right. all questions are around so there there is this within the christian spectrum within um within jewish thought there is a whole range of basic questions mm -hmm. of morality within islam so if it's theological mm -hmm. from what theological uh, source does it mm -hmm. come? If it is non-theological, if it's philosophical, um, so again, you're very right in what you said. One first has to address or come to uh, an idea where, on what, where do the basis of mm -hmm. my moral thinking, my moral code come from? Because without mm -hmm. doing that, how can one say anything is moral or not moral. Right, right, moral exactly, good. exactly. Yeah, so what are some of the moral justifications for preemptive warfare 
in your opinion? Well, the first I would first I would say I think most almost most uh, uh, theorists, most theologians, mm-hmm. most moralists would say by definition preemptive war is immoral. Okay. Now, on the most extreme view of that would be the pacifist position saying that if you engage in if you engage in war and you engage in war your justification is that the salvation of my nation is uh is it has primacy over everything else well mm-hmm. that is an arrogance that is immoral so uh, one could argue it's very hard to on a moral basis for preemptive war because it's making certain assumptions mm-hmm. you're saying that i am going to take this action mm-hmm. people will be killed People will, will suffer. Mm-hmm. Uh, there will be uh, collateral damage. Right. But the justification is that the my nation or my uh, if it's a foreign nation, my tribe, whatever it is, its existence is the highest point of my morality. Right. Its existence right. is everything is secondary to its existence. And again, that's pretty much the Israeli uh, point of view. That mm-hmm. The state of Israel, for all kinds of historic reasons, for all kinds of theological reasons, its existence is by definition moral, and that which right. challenges existence is immoral. Therefore, um, the preemptive war would be justified. Right. right. Uh, it's, but again, I come back to there's an arrogance in the arrogance of saying that whatever I am, uh, the, our continued existence transcends all other values. Now, right. that is an arrogance, and that is, in many ways, an immoral statement. Back then, I come back to Niebuhr. But societies cannot operate, or do not, they can't operate on the same basis as individuals. What might be immoral for an individual, we accept mm-hmm. as not immoral for society. Right, right, exactly. And I think what you just said brings up another really important question. So that arrogance um, can be very nationalistic. Like um, in some of the students that have coached this year already, many of them will have like in their value framework for their debate case um, that, you know, they'll mention my value is self-defense. And then they'll define that as America defending itself from potential threats. And I was asking, why is it necessary to have America like in your definition, right? So why, and I understand why these values translate to them as American ideals, because they're American. But, and another resolution we're dealing with is nationalism versus globalism, which one is more beneficial, right? Which is another whole separate topic. Um, But that arrogance can be a great sense of national pride. So a lot of Americans specifically tend to think that preemptive war is more moral for them than it would be for our Middle Eastern neighbors or anyone else. Um, So you have to ask yourself if this value is like, if it's moral to you, if I were to say preemptive war is fine for America because our judgment is far and away better than every other country, right? We have to ask ourselves like, what would that look like if another country were to say we are directly threatened by the United States and to them, whatever we're doing translates as an incontrovertible threat, would the State Department, you know, declare that a just preemptive war? Well, yes. And uh, <laughs> we see our history has shown that my tribe is threatened by your tribe. Therefore, I, if I wipe out your tribe, my tribe is better. Yeah. That's the thing that runs through all, that runs through, all through, through history. A, a good example of what you just said was um, ISIS would argue that because they have, anyway, I, we have ultimate truth. This is the ultimate truth. Right. Therefore, anyone who opposes that is against God's will. So the United States has not only the most powerful military force, but its cultural power, which ISIS would argue, and Al-Qaeda before that, its cultural power is destructive of that which mm-hmm. is true and right. Therefore, any action taken to destroy that threat to the truth which we have is by definition moral. Right. Well, once you get into that into that argument, it, it, it really comes it comes to and of course America's justification on it is we are or have been or we believe ourselves to be uh, a nation that is has been for the most part moral in our mm-hmm. actions. Now 
again, if you look at it historically, you have to raise questions. The, right. <laughs> the annihilation of the Native American, uh, the oh practice of slavery. You could go all through history. The um, questions of um, the dropping of the atomic bomb on, right. uh, on innocent right. civilians. There are real questions about has America always operated as the mm -hmm. paragon of virtue? If you're going right, to stake, right. if you're going to stake your argument in America, by definition, is moral and right, then you've got a lot of history that you have to explain away. Right. Sure, oh, definitely. You know, we keep talking about innocent civilians. So I did want to ask you: Do you think preemptive war by nature is more of a threat to civilians than you know maybe regular war, whatever we define that? To be? Uh, that's hard. That's that's hard to say. It depends what you do in preemptive war. All right. right. I mean, I mean, if you were to say, we are threatened by you, here's a bomb, like, obviously, that would probably be worse for civilians and other things, but yeah, there are yeah, a lot yeah, of it, types. It, it, it's, it's who gets targeted, and, and, and the reality is, in, in any kind of war, in any kind of violence, uh, civilians get targeted. But okay, let's give an example, one where you, you didn't target the incident. Uh, in, in 81, when the Israelis bombed the Oslo, or so like, um, you um, uh, what they what they believe to be developing nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Well, a relatively small number of people, a tiny number of people were actually killed, the people right. who worked worked on in that plant. You didn't have any collateral any collateral damage. So you could say, okay, a very small number of people, those people were complicit in the threat because they worked there. Now you can then ask the question. Did right. they work there by choice, or did they work there because sure. they had to? Right. But the point was, you you aren't killing very many, uh, uh, very many of the innocent, and yet for the Israelis, this was a very important thing preventing mm. down the road a possible nuclear attack which could kill millions of people. So, to right. the Israeli point of view, right. the, in proportionality. This was a very small, a very very small <laughs> matter for a potentially very large, right, uh, rule. Right, and you know we continue to be faced with that question about whether you know a lives lost in the moment will prevent like greater lives lost down the road, um, and that's very hard to prove. Oh, it's, very it's hard. It's, to impossible prove. it's impossible to prove. It really is. Right. A, it's like most things. It's a faith statement. Mm -hmm. Most things right. are faith statements. Uh, we, we we generally. Uh, think of faith statements in terms of one's religious views, but you have faith statements in terms of national views. Sure. I have faith in this position and I don't don't right. confuse me with with all kinds of different counter and rational arguments because this is an article of faith. And right. by definition, an article of faith is something that needs no proof. Right. That's the difference between <laughs> right. faith is where is when when all rationality, when all ways of coming to truth by any means uh of rationality or thought in that we've now hit the we've hit the line where you cannot go any further. That's where faith begins. It's simply mm -hmm. a conviction and belief. Um, right. So we use that, that uh, we use that role in religion all the time. We say, we I'm going to prove my faith. Well, that's a that's a contradiction in terms. Right. It goes to an extent. If, if you're going to prove, because faith is where where proof ends. Well, and the same thing with with more. I'm going to prove that my uh, faith in my tribe, nation, clan, whatever. Uh, <laughs> right. that, you're going to get, faith is where rationality is. Now, rationality can, can take you much. A lot of people, of course, start in, in terms of religion, start their faith way back here. Right. But rationality can take you a lot further. <laughs> but right. Further. But, then, mm -hmm. oh, but ultimately, you will reach a point where it, it can take you no further, and that's where faith begins. I think in terms of international relations and making national decisions, that point is very frustrating for a lot of individuals, especially debaters, who the nature of their hobby is to prove things, right? So what would your advice be to debaters in explaining that point where national decisions are made on faith instead of, you know, hardcore proof and evidence? Well, I think what you have to start, you have to start with is that, um, this is a reality. Nations are going. Nations are going to operate ultimately on, on faith. What you have to say is um, take rationality as far as rationality can possibly take you, mm -hmm. and then 
let's use the example of, of because it's right before us right now, North Korea. Right. Um, that one line of thought and one that I would tend to ascribe to is because we're dealing with an irrational individual uh, in Kim Jong Un, uh, if he can achieve a nuclear weapon and he can reach the United States, it's not that he's going to that day, show, but the likelihood is very high that he would employ it for irrational reasons. <laughs> right. and you might apply it to a certain president of the United States that you can apply all the rationality you want, but he's a man who's proven that he, uh, he operates a good deal of the time outside the bonds of rationality. So Indeed. what you're saying, if, if North Korea has a nuclear weapon, we are deeply, deeply threatened. Uh, now the question, the question is, uh, at what point do you say the threat has reached a level mm -hmm. that we cannot, we can't run the risk of going beyond that point? Are there no other means of accomplishing the goal of that mm -hmm. reaching that threat where they can strike the United States with a nuclear weapon? Then you have to, you have to say, okay, if you're speaking moral terms, what if they do fire a nuclear weapon at the United States and kill X amount of people? Are the costs of preventing that from happening morally? Mm -hmm. Uh, and how many North Koreans one would kill in a, a strike, and maybe more importantly, the, important, the, the retaliation towards South Korea and the, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of uh, if we take out the ability to take out their their nuclear weapons uh, capability. So you, ha it comes down to a question of proportionality. Are is the city of Los Angeles uh, disappearing from the face of the earth? Um, proportionality to North Korea, to uh, South Korea, uh, does proportionality exist here, or do you simply say, mm. no, our lives are more important right. than their lives? Right. They all become very deeply difficult moral questions. Indeed, indeed. So if you were to be an affirmative debater on this resolution and it was your duty in that round to say it is morally justified, what do you think are like the top two reasons that you well, can give? You, you start with saying, you, you start that it is my belief and my faith that the American um, political order is a superior political order. It is... Um, it's not God's chosen <laughs> instrument, but it, uh, but it is and has been a benefit to world society. Mm -hmm. It's a continued existence is in the best interest of all on the planet. Okay. You start with that assumption. So would you interpret the resolution through the American government viewpoint, or would you just kind of look at it objectively as like moral or not moral? Because I think, I mean, you, arguably you could do either. Well, yeah, but if you're going to get into, it's going to be so, because you're going to be, if you're going to tell an abstract moral limb, mm -hmm. you're going to get, you go back to like when we started this thing, if you're, you're, right. you're, the, where does your morality come from? Right. You almost have to say, I'm going to do it on the basis uh, of, of my nation. Right. So, um, and again, right. I'll come back to Israel, because Israel argues why they as a nation are mm -hmm. exempt from some of the restraints that would be on other nations. And the argument is the history of what has been done to Jewish people throughout yeah. all time. The, the Holocaust is the most extreme example of the, um, uh, of the persecution and the, the killing of Jews throughout history. That Israel is a sanctuary for the continuing maintenance of the Jewish uh, people mm -hmm. gives Israel a special, a special role, a special place in history. Therefore, that they cannot be held to the same um, rules. That would, uh, I mean, for instance, is Canada? Does it have an essential role in human history? That if Canada right. ceased to exist, right? Uh, <laughs> 
this would be a crime against all of humanity. Well, no, if you're Canadian, you want Canada to. But, but so what you're saying is when you argue and defend preemptive war, you're kind of arguing the same thing as the state of Israel. Maybe not on quite the grounds of an historical thing, not quite the theological grounds, but you're saying America is special and America there's justification for America doing whatever it is to perpetuate the continuum of America. Therefore, it justifies these, it justifies these, these right. actions. Now, of course, the question is that you know, France and Argentina and Palau could, right. could argue the, the same thing. They may not have as much historical evidence, particularly mm. Argentina and Palau, right. may not have as much historical evidence to bring forth to the question. Mm -hmm. But it still comes to, it, it comes to, and we're just going to accept that my nation is the most important thing that exists. And that which continues the viability of my nation. Now, uh, and that's been uh, said, in, my nation, right or wrong, and please, by God's grace, may we always be right. Right. I mean, it, if you're going to have that kind of an argument, it does impose upon you a very high standard okay. of truly being a moral force. If you're going right. to go out and drop a nuclear weapon on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and not only kill all the people that you kill, but the legacy forever of those mm -hmm. people affected, generations after generations affected by that nuclear radiation, mm -hmm. the onus of the first time it was ever used, and that, that kind of, if you're going to do that and you're going to justify it, uh, for all kinds of reasons, it was necessary for all people, then you're going to have, it also is implicit that you're going to have to be a nation that truly does make the cost worth paying, worth paying. Right. Uh, right. So there are obligations, they obligate, all responsibilities incur obligations. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility of having great power, the responsibility to unleash great military power carries with it awesome responsibilities okay. um, and that, that's one thing you just you simply have to accept yes it's arrogant it is um and i think admitting that and understanding that will probably win debate there's like a lot of rapport with their audience because the, just being this objective speaker who says we are better than anyone else i am interpreting this resolution as moral for america maybe not so much for anyone else and we will handle this moral responsibility far greater it is arrogant, and I think recognizing that it's arrogant and then proving that perhaps America may be the best government to maintain this responsibility, I feel like that would be a much well, more it's, winsome it's argument. The only way that you, it's the only way you really can argue right. <laughs> the, the use. Now, the pacifist position is the most consistent position, mm -hmm. that violence is the ultimate sin. In fact, uh, the guy that I wrote a book on, um, that he, the, ori he, the original sin was violence. Right. Violence is the original sin. The committing of violence has no justification anyway, ever. Uh, violence is by definition sin. And therefore, you, if violence is done to you, you accept it. You, with it, Historical with uh, theological traditions, with Christian tradition, you turn the other cheek. With other you, uh, you, but for you to engage in violence is the ultimate sin. Right. So if if you are struck by a nuclear power and it wipes you away, too bad. <laughs> uh, you know the planet, and maybe a hundred million years will re, you might will, will right. regenerate. Right. Uh, mankind or some other species will generate. It, it is the ultimate of not putting yourself in the mm -hmm. arrogance of your, the superiority of nation, our people, or even humanity, the arrogance of humanity over cockroaches. Right. <laughs> um, that's a consistent position. Yeah. It's a position that not many people, and not most pacifists, are in. Mm -hmm. that is the most extreme, mm -hmm. consistent mm -hmm. definition of passive. Any other position has all kinds of irrational uh, to build into it. Definitely, yeah. So, alternatively, if you were negative on this resolution, obviously you have a wealth of arguments available to you. You do. On why preemption may not be such a great yeah, idea. Yeah, and, and the, the simplest is that 
who is to say it's not going to cause more problems down the way than if you hadn't done it? And you've got a perfect exactly. example of Iraq. I mean, it, this was preventing war, the fear that, uh, that, it, that uh, if Saddam did have nuclear weapons, it's in control. But the reality of what happened, we went in, we took out an evil man, there's no question about that. Right. But the huge number of people's lives that have been lost, the horrific conditions, the disarray in Iraq, and Saddam Hussein at least kept a certain stability. Right. And it really is, it was the undermining of it, and ISIS comes out, Al Qaeda comes out, this, right. ISIS comes right. out. So, that has pre happened pre times. preventive yeah. war turned out to be far worse than anything that would have happened <laughs> right. by him. Naturally. So, right. so the, the biggest answer is, why are you so convinced that mm -hmm. your preemptive action is going to turn out to be good in the long If you If we say, we're going to, take, we're going to knock out North Korea's uh, uh, nuclear capacity, mm -hmm. um, may you not create such instability throughout the Korean Peninsula, into China, into Japan, that the whole world, uh, uh, well, in fact, you might even, anytime you, anytime you use nuclear weapons, there's always the danger you're going to trigger the whole, uh, you know, the whole Armageddon. So, uh, I mean, yeah. what if you trigger the whole Armageddon? Um, so, yeah. it, 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 not being able to preemptive impact. war, yeah. preventive war, the biggest justice is how do you justify, how do you know that you aren't creating something worse? Because there's plenty of historical evidence. Vietnam, you know, I had experience with a perfect example. There's no question that the communists in the, in the 50s and early 60s were evil. It was not a good thing for the Vietnamese people, but, the, but what we unleashed by going in mm. wrong, they unleashed something of monumental, uh, horrible nature. And in the end, mm. Uh, things ended up being pretty much in 75 what they would have been in, in uh, 55 or 65 if we'd never been involved. So right. who right. is to say with all the consequences that you're going to be better off and, with no doing it? So. And by nature, actions of faith are the most unpredictable, right? Because you can't yeah. predict the impacts. That's and right. you cannot. for a government, that's terrifying, right? That's Especially, right. you know, trying to justify an ideology morally. Be being unable to implicate its practical you know, applications is really difficult. You can do modeling and modeling and modeling and, and all that, but you can't, you can't ever know what the, you can't ever know what anyone's, you can model what my behavior would be this afternoon, but ultimately you can't, I mean, you can say, uh, based on history, we've studied this man every minute of his life and he will leave here, he'll go home and he'll have a cup of tea and he will read a book and all, and that, with, you know, I'm giving 999 .9, but who's to know that I might walk out of here and, and decide uh, to go rob a bank or something like that? It, it, has no, it has well, it, it has no <laughs> historical, it has no historical precedent that would happen. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible that couldn't ha it, it could happen. So right. ultimately, you can model and model and model, but you never really know because every action mm -hmm. is it, it's kind of, it kind of starts from ground zero. Every action, right, right. One thing we always coach debaters to do is instead, when you have like, you know, two terms in a, in a problem. So like here you have preemptive war or not preemptive war, right? So when you have these two terms, we always say, instead of using them as like competing ideals and saying one is good, one is bad, always, maybe you could just say X has like greater value than Y, but both of them has value, right? My, my way, uh, and I, I was a debater. Still are in many respects. Well, I, uh, I'm proud of it. I, I, I compiled uh, the most great points in the history of the school, and I think still exists to this day, 50, 60 <laughs> years later. I think still, I think still <laughs> exists today. What school was it? Uh, no, it was a high school. When I was, oh, a, when I was okay. a high school debate. Okay, okay. um, and what I did then is you diffuse the question. You never let yourself ever get put in. Mm -hmm. You never let you get put in either or position. You never. never right. you, as I started this thing out, you start by defining the terms. You start by making it a bigger and more diffuse issue. You never get trapped. Okay, now, is it this or this? Which you never let yourself be put in that position. Right, that's you never let yourself There's be trapped in that position. Two options, right. You always, now, let's define the terms. Let's broaden the issue. And that's what you do as a baby. You're taking them as something like there, there's no, there isn't any answer. Now, you could say, uh, let, let's say the question is, um, 
should women be raped or should women not be raped? Well, I don't think you need to diffuse that question. I think the answer is pretty clear. There, there, it's pretty clear. On that. So and you can have an argument there. But most things are not that easy. Right. They're, they're right. much more. But don't let, I mean, there are, there are things you literally have to draw the line. Do you believe, uh, do you believe that uh, children, that, do you believe that Americans should have the, people should have the right to child pornography. Well, I'm, I would say, no, no. Right, that's black just, and white. That's right. a black and white issue. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are other people who don't want to argue with you. But to me, it would be a black and white issue. Right. But most of the issues that you come up in a debate are not black and white. And don't let yourself get trapped in. They wouldn't be very good debate topics if they were, if they were that simple. That's What's funny is debaters will put themselves in that black and white box. They will say, my side of the resolution is good and your side is bad. Yeah. And they, they do that. I don't know why. And that's not, I mean, that's because it's ultimately, it's ultimately a losing proposition because you, you never want to defeat the adversary totally. Well, you want to trap them in a the corner where they have nothing, no other alternative but to lash out. <laughs> uh, you don't want to trap them. You don't want to beat them down and humiliate right. them. You want it to be reasonable you, to set a situation so they ultimately say, your argument is actually so reasonable that I think I'm going to have to come around to start seeing things. You know, exactly. In your, in your way. That's, that's, what you you're trying, that's what you're trying to do. When you, and that's true persuasion, right? Like yeah. convincing someone who's on the total opposite end of the spectrum that there is so much common ground right. and reasonability in between what you believe and they believe that actually they do believe what you believe because all of the steps in between, mm -hmm. they believe those, right? That's right. You don't, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's only momentary victory in just crushing someone and driving them into the ground. That's, I wish you would come judge in spade tournaments. Momentary yeah. victory. But long term, it's not, it, it, it's, we've seen, we see that in wars. When, right. when you have defeated nations totally and completely and crushed them into the ground, it right. has negative, it has negative consequences. You always want to give in any negotiation, mm -hmm. in, in, in international negotiation, give give the other side the ability to kind of uh, leave or retreat and save honor and save face. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. when you can create situations that have lasting viability. Right. Uh, when you say, okay, we've just got the power, we can, uh, we can crush you and you will have... Well, in the short term, that might work, but you sowed the seeds of resistance. You sowed the seeds right. of resistance that were right. springing up. When you've given honorable uh, saving face, you give them, okay, now we are all committed to the new mm -hmm. consensus. We're committed to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do. That's what you do in, in debate. It's, you want to create a situation where everybody walks away saving face and with honor, but exactly. you, because you did it so skillfully, everyone knows you're the architect of having done this. Right. You're, exactly. the, you're the greatest negotiator because you created the situation that allowed this to happen. And, and then in terms of being judged who wins or who, mm -hmm. you're obviously the winner because you're a better negotiator. Right, exactly. In fact, our old founder used to say that he married a debater and he was, you know, you know, master, you know, speaker as well, and everyone always said, you know, because you married a debater, do you guys fight a lot? And he always said, no, debate isn't about arguing, it's about finding common ground. So no, we have a great marriage. So yeah, I love your views on that. Last kind of like issue on the table, I think, in terms of grim war is cyber warfare. And we kind of talked about this a little bit before we got started. Um, but I think a lot of debaters this year are underestimating what cyber warfare is capable of, and also the fact that it's the next battlefield as we're moving into you know, a new phase of technology. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts? What are your concerns? Well, I mean, clearly, uh, if you think nuclear war is bad, it is. But cyber, just think about the ability of someone today to knock out everything of the way we live our life, to knock out all of the, 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 the structure of Mm -hmm. of, of, of electric grids, of the power system, of our water, of water systems, of, of security clearances, secu everything. Yeah. I mean, oh, literally yeah. everything from uh, the computers had the ability to knock that out. Uh, and you instantaneously, you return to the Stone Age. Exactly. And uh, that cannot be uh, underestimated. 
this is the real thread. This is what, what adversaries on both sides are working on to reach a point where you can strike massively mm. uh, in undermining the very way the society is able to operate. And those that have that capacity will be the military. I mean, let's go back to North Korea. If through cyber, we, we don't see this in, in some respect. We saw that we set back probably 10 years, Iraq's ability, uh, Iran's, Iran's ability to develop a nuclear weapon by a uh, malware mm -hmm. put into their, into their uh, nuclear facility that uh, destroyed, destroyed their developing nuclear weapons. And yet it was, it was, it was hidden well enough that it took them years and years to even know that it was doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine that ability, right. let's just look back, back, back to North Korea, that we somehow were able to use cyber warfare through malware to make sure that when their missiles, they fired them toward the United States, they blew up. Right. Or didn't work, or blew up there. Uh, this is a tremendous capacity, mm -hmm. and it's the next, not the next, it is the present, one of the present grounds of warfare. So do not in any way underestimate the power of cyber warfare. Right. It's there, it's existing, it's going on. Now, if we talk about Russia attempt to manipulate our very electoral <laughs> process to, uh, to literally change, and let, let's say, you know, one of the things I think is probably stopped. We were in the process of going toward an infrastructure, an, an internet infrastructure, where the moment you push the lever, you go into the into the voting booth, you punch the lever, and that that ballot is that ballot is cast at a national center. And the moment the the polls close, they close. The moment they close, you literally can announce the winner because it's all every every single vote has flowed in and it's all been counted. Now. That's all wonderful and good, and it is, but also think what somebody who is able to penetrate into that system and control that and change the vote could do. Um, we were moving probably in more in a direction. Now we're decoupling everything, mm -hmm. everything, so that you know, a, uh, a, a, a individual uh, ballot box is not connected to anything else so that somebody can't get in and change the, the votes there. Right. Um, so yeah, cyber warfare, it's going on now. It's the way, it's the way of the future. And the, those who have it and can exercise it have tremendous power. Those who are vulnerable to it, all kinds of bad things happen. So it right. should not by any means de uh, be depreciated. So do you think that the type of warfare used against a country should reflect the type of threat? So for instance, if there is a cyber threat, um, we should preemptively strike on the cyber front, or you know, if there is a nuclear front, we should strike, you know, in that well, regard. Well, we always, it, it's, it's been a principle of international practice to, that responses should be uh, commiserate with, uh, with the initial, uh, proportionality. And I think right, proportionality. Right. For instance, um, um, if um, Mexico, to open up the gates and flood uh, uh, 10,000 people, uh, uh, Mexican immigrants, into the United States. We should say that's absolutely intolerable. It is unacceptable. We're going to nuke Mexico City. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that, the level of proportionality is, is outrageous. Right, right. Responses have to be within, uh, if, if they would do this, yeah, there are consequences. You don't just say, not enough, you shouldn't have done this. There are consequences uh, that one pays. But you have to keep it within the level of proportionality. proportionality. Right. Otherwise, um, yeah, I've, I've, always, I've always said, you want to stop speeding? We can stop. I can I can stop speeding, not 100%, but almost 100%. That when the highway patrolman pulls you over and he says, you were going you were going 15 miles past the speed limit, pulls out his gun and shoots you in the head and leaves your body limit. Right. Well, pretty right. soon, we would only have a few fools speeding. Yeah, sure. And after and after we... Would you catch, do one them, of them? catch them and shot them and shot them? Well, but the proportionality is out is outrageous. Right. So you, 
response must be within a, uh, within right. a reasonable proportion. So yeah, now does that mean that it must be totally symmetrical? If it's a cyber, a cyber attack, you go attack. Right. Not necessarily. I, it, there may be other I think cyber attacks are a great way to disable a country, yeah, even they're, if they're not you, a threat. Right. You, in a cyber way. Your response, your response perhaps have, must have proportionality. It right. doesn't necessarily have to be symmetrical. They attacked you, uh, cyber. You attack you. No, you, they can do other way, and that's of course what we do uh, with, with with sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, right. One takes right. military military action. We use economic sanctions. Mm -hmm to right. try to control military action. So no, it doesn't have to be the same thing, but it has to have a certain proportionality. Right, right. Okay, so do you think cyber warfare is going to become or is more powerful than traditional warfare? Um, the potential certainly is there. It is there. The, the, uh, the, counter, the countermeasures, the offense is going to ever increase. You have to constantly be create the countermeasure to prevent it. Now, if you can keep a balance there, you can you could and we we talk about with nuclear weapons, may it and mutual assured destruction because right. you've got all these nuclear weapons, but if you actually use them, you're going to retaliate and and everybody everybody loses because the whole world. Right, well, right. with cyber warfare, you don't have to reach that. You can have a tremendous capacity, but if you have a counter capacity to check it. It ultimately just it ends in a checkmate, and, the right. checkmate. and you just keep you keep revving and revving and revving, and revving up the level, but you got to rev up the level of checkmate. Right. So it's less danger. In, in some ways, it's less dangerous. Uh, but you no, know, clearly, cyber warfare is the uh, now. Does as was uh, it, it's also symmetrical. If you you may have the most powerful uh, cyber capacity in the world, mm -hmm. but does that stop an individual terrorist with a knife from right. attacking you? Know, so there's a right. there's an asymmetrical uh, lack of technology. As we, you know, in in Vietnam we had all this high technology, but all the high technology in the world couldn't stop an individual with a gun uh, right. running around. So. There are all different kinds of levels that one must face certain threats, all different kinds of levels, mm -hmm. from uh, very high levels down to very low levels. And uh, those who deal with national security have to deal with, uh, right. with all these kinds of all these kinds of levels. And it's very, very hard and very complex. And it's not going to get any easier. It, it, the world has been getting more complex and more dangerous since the first caveman threw a rock at another caveman, then he picked mm -hmm. up a club <laughs> and went after him, and then he made a, guy made a spear out of a rock, and, mm -hmm. and it just it continues to escalate, 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 and I don't see any uh, chance that it's going to stop technology, it's going right. to stop escalating. Right. So, um, the, the, what mankind, using his best rationality, has to, as much as possible, do two things. You, you have to have the capacity to counter respond, but then you have to use rationality and reason and intellect to find grounds of people cooperating and finding it mute. It is mutually in their benefit mm -hmm. to cooperate rather than kill each other. Exactly. How right. long we can do that? I don't, right. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think there will be a time. Mm -hmm when it fails and then right. it's not going to be very good. My purpose is that in my lifetime and the lifetime of the people who I'm trying to influence, we can kick the can down the road a few more a few more decades, a few more centuries, <laughs> hopefully a few more eons, but there probably will come a day when the can uh, doesn't get kicked down the road. And, and that, I, I hope I'm not around at that point. I can help you with that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but, and so finally, one question is, you know, the United States typically responds in some sort of, you know, war fashion, either when they're trying to be a savior, right? And someone else is threatened and it's our job because of our moral convictions to help them, right? Maybe they're an ally, maybe it's just, you know, we want to build up democracy in the country or it's a direct threat to us. Um, typically preemptive warfare, 
is only when it's pretty much self-defense, right? Um, or do you think the United States may have grounds to use preemptive warfare when it isn't a direct self-defense response? Well, um, ideologues argue that when you have when you have truth, absolute complete truth, it justifies whatever action you take. If uh, and we've seen political regimes who have absolute truth. Now, were the Jews any threat to the Nazis? Were they a physical threat? No. <laughs> No, it's never a threat. Ideologically, right. Well, I mean, you know, the truth of the matter is, in Germany, one-tenth of one percent of the German population was Jewish. It was only when, when, when the Nazis swept into Poland and swept into Eastern Europe that they began to confront large number of Jews. You had a tiny, tiny little fraction of people. But to a form of ideological thinking, the very existence of that element or that thought was a threat. So if you have ideologues who say it's no physical threat, it's no national security threat, but the very fact that that, it, that exists is a threat to moral fiber. I want a good example. I just saw an example of that uh, last night on television. Um, that uh, it was uh, a thing in the 90s. It said that Homosexuality is so heinous and in its existence that it's a threat to the very moral fiber of individual, of nation, of morality, of everything. And therefore, the acceptance of homosexuality means the end of the human condition as we know it. Therefore, any action that one takes to eliminate this threat. Now, <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm saying is, ideological thinking, religious, political, that elevates any particular thing, vegetarians are a threat to it, that uh, then, yeah, I mean, there, there, there will, again, there will always be potential for threats one must maintain rationality, one must maintain a moral compass, whatever right. that compass is, right. that you don't let that kind of thing prevail. We certainly see it. We certainly see it in the world today. We see it in ISIS, but we see it within elements of the United States. There are people in the United States that, that honestly believe in their miscreant minds <laughs> that uh, transgender people, they, they kind of, Kind of homosexuality is sort of being okay. All right, well that has come and it hasn't. The, the world hasn't come to an end. But now the latest thing is transgender. Or that's the end of human existence. But there, there are people within the body of the United States, and if if if, if they prevail, if they find support, if they, you know, then one can hear and one could one could how could one have ever said that. Uh, the, in those, one of the most civilized countries in Europe, that the Nazis, oh yeah, there were seeds, but the Nazis would come to power. Could you, I don't know, right, years before right. that. Could you, a lot of the other things, could you, uh, the Houthi and the Tutsi in Rwanda had been living in relative, relative acceptance of each other for, for right, a long, right, long time, right. explodes. There are all these things that just, my friend in Ghana, uh, Ghana, uh, the first African country to gain its independence, Ghana has a well thriving democracy. Ghana is its functions, all that, but as you said, ultimately, when a people are tribal, and most of the world is tribal, and it is your ultimate identity, and you ultimately have a fear of it, he said, it would not take that much of a spark, and pretty much then all of this civility, all of these things are stripped away, and you're in a tribal war, you're in a tribal war, and he's true, it's, it's right here, right. We, the patinas of civilization, the patinas of moral behavior are so very, very fragile over all mm -hmm. human beings, it doesn't take much right. to strip it away and right. then pretty soon you're in, you're in the law of the jungle. Right. Great thoughts. In summary, what would be, you know, the things, if you could give debaters in this resolution, you know, your, you know, your 
all overarching wisdom for this topic, what would you most want them to remember? That war is the ultimate failure of mankind. When you come to judgment that you're going to commit violence and killing of your fellow man, it is failure by definition. There is no such thing as a war that is, we all we storm them, we, uh, we, we cheer them, and we, uh, we uh, invoke them, and we, uh, the grandeur of winning war. War is by definition an evil thing. Right. It is something resort. that, it's something that sometimes, it, in, in, in the fallibilities of being human, it becomes, it's something we have to do or we, we find ourselves doing it. But whatever we do to prevent getting into that situation is a good thing. However we succumb to doing it is a bad thing. Right. Um, right. Do not make it easy to engage in the violence against another people, tribe, nation, person. Um, I preemptive war. I would virtually say it is in ninety nine point nine 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 percent is not something that can be justified in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Now, when it when it comes down to the practical, if I knew inconvertibly, absolutely inconvertibly, that. Uh, that the United States was going to be, let's go back to the Cold War, the, so the, the, the Russia is going to unleash their weapons and destroy the United States totally, inconvertible. And I had the power to prevent that through nuclear weapons or something. Would I do it? Yes. Would I justify it as being, I would say, okay, it's sin, <laughs> and I would, it is sin, and I'll. I'll rest with them. Ultimately, it helps to be a person who basically believes that man is depraved, man is sinful, man is uh, is in need of, of, of grace of some. Is it sin? Yes. Is it ultimate sin? Yes. Am I going to do it? Yes. Am I going to say that I throw myself on God's mercy? Yes. So right. it, kind of, it helps when one believes that man should strive, should try to be moral, should try to do the right thing, but ultimately we are incapable of doing it, whether by the nature of our creation, whether the nature of our socialization. And so one ultimately going to have to throw oneself on the mercy of whatever deity one believes in. <laughs> it helps to have that view. But am I, am I, I went to war. I didn't want to kill people. I didn't even think the war was just. I'm going to do, I decided I'm not going to Canada. I'm not going to do these things. I'm going to go do it. If I commit, if I am immoral in doing it, all I can say is I'm going to uh, throw myself in the grace of, uh, of, of, of the creator that I believe in. Uh, that's all, all that one can do. One does the best that one can do, knowing that ultimately one is going to fail. Right. And war is that last resort. So when and we get there, is, it does War mean, is failure by definition. Right, war is right. failure. It is sin. It is the worst sin by definition. Are we going to, have we been doing it since the beginning of time? Yes. Are we going to do it till the end? Yes. Um, right. And the on best, the, the best that I can do is try to prevent it as much as possible. And then right. when we engage in it, to do it as if, if there's such a thing, if it's not an oxymoron, do it as humanely as possible. Right. If that's not an oxymoron. Right. And don't yeah. glory in it. Exactly. Uh, um, I, I have a hard time um, justifying the glory and killing. Now, do I selfishly when I see that when ISIS is killed by a drone? Yes, it makes me happy. But on the other hand, when I was fighting in Vietnam, I knew the other guy had the same belief I did. He was fighting for me, for a nation only. Do I do uh, do I hate him? No. Um, do um, do I know he wants to kill me? Yes. 
if it has to be, I will kill him. But do I hate him? No. Uh, does it help to build an artificial sense of hate? Yes, it does help. But I just couldn't do it. I could not do that. Um, this is where I find myself. This is the condition I find myself. Now, I'm no saint. Do I, would I, if, uh, and I've said the time, if a person comes into my house and, and uh, accosts my wife, rapes my wife, and I come into the house and I have a gun, would I kill him with great joy? Yes. Is that sin? Yes. But would I do it with great joy? Right. Yes. Right. Because I am, the seeds of, the seeds of, of, of sin are deep within me. <laughs> right. Well, and I think many could argue that there were even instances where God said a war is maybe, you know, not what he desired, but he, he commanded people to engage in it. Yeah. I mean, so I think, you know, there are situations where it's, definitely failure but it is a necessary action yeah I mean, right? that, yeah. Is, that is I mean, every religious tradition has that, uh, that 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 is that's the nature of the human existence and i think in every instance even biblically where god you know green lighted a war it wasn't because it was the joy of god's heart you know it wasn't because a people deserved it and he hated them it was you know always for some greater moral reason and it pained him you know and it was definitely not his joy but i think that's really you know a good thing to keep into consideration so, since we're driving more as debaters we just I start with the assumption that there isn't a perfect position mm -hmm. it's simply a pragmatic decision um if you're going to argue for a creative war you argue on pragmatic grounds if you're against it you argue that it's, it's not the most pragmatic you argue this on pragmatic grounds and i and uh, that's mm -hmm. not one is an absolute right position, doesn't it? It's just right. pragmatism. Right. All right. Any final thoughts? No, I have no final thoughts. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. I like looking at myself talking. Do you need to do it for a few more minutes? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs>